Good afternoon. My name is James Thompson. I'm the author of Thomas Jefferson's Enlightenment, Paris 1785, which was published earlier this year by Commonwealth Books of Virginia. In earlier comments, I explained that the man who went to France in July of 1784 was a circumspect political loner and that he went to France to rebuild his life in the society that produced the Marquis de Chastelux and to become a citizen of the world like that worldly French academician. This afternoon, I'm going to comment on the plan Jefferson devised to accomplish his private mission. Conversations about Jefferson today tend to divide between Jefferson, the inventor of human rights, and Jefferson, the father of his slave's children. These conversations should not prevent us from noticing how Jefferson conducted his daily affairs and accomplished his larger purposes. Jefferson may have been a skilled patriotic draftsman and lonely after the death of his wife, but he was not an abstract thinker like, for example, John Locke or Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He exhibited instead the traits of a scientist, observing, measuring, enumerating, and organizing. Jefferson sought to create right order, precise order, where he thought things were not in proper order. Four examples of this are, first, in the summer of 1774, alone on his mountaintop, Jefferson crystallized his objection to British rule in America. He asserted that British Americans are a sovereign people, that the hierarchical government of King George III violated the natural order, that the English king had no right to meddle in the affairs of America, and that by right Americans should govern themselves. He built on these ideas in the winter and spring of 1776 when he drafted his constitution for his new state. When he finished his plan for the government of Virginia, he put these claims in the, at the foundation of his argument for separation from England and the creation of independent governments in the American colonies. Second, after declaring independence, Jefferson joined the first Virginia Assembly. There, he conducted a carefully planned legislative campaign to fix the flaws in his state's new constitution. In eight weeks, Jefferson drafted, aided in drafting, and revised more than 15 bills. These measures included a plan to change the land laws of his state, a plan to disestablish the Church of England, a plan to promote westward migration, plans for implementing the state's new court system, and a plan for revising Virginia's outdated colonial code. Third, after being appointed to the new committee of revisers, Jefferson spent two and a half years writing dozens of pieces of legislation that he considered necessary for his new state to become, quote, a well-ordered republic, unquote. Fourth, when he returned from France in the fall of 1789, he redesigned and reconstructed his mountaintop home and gardens to meet the needs of the Renaissance man he became during his sojourn in France. This enterprise occupied him for 25 years. In this last undertaking, Jefferson's true genius blossomed. As an architect and engineer, he created and implemented complex plans for some of our country's most beautiful buildings. With this same care and precision, in the winter of 1781, Jefferson undertook to write what became his only book. Notes on the State of Virginia was a detailed, comprehensive collection of facts about the natural, social, and political characteristics of his state. The book emerged from answers that Jefferson prepared for 13 questions he received from French attaché, the Marquis de Barbet Marbois. Unlike his revolutionary political documents, Jefferson sought input from several knowledgeable individuals. First among these was his compatriot in the Independence Party and fellow member of the American Philosophical Society, Charles Thompson. He sent Thompson an early draft of his manuscript and incorporated information he received back from the Philadelphian. On his way to 
uh, board his France-bound ship in the summer of 1784, Jefferson stopped in Philadelphia, but failed to locate his friend. He did, however, purchase an uncommonly large panther skin. By this means, Dumas Malone observed, he hoped to convince Buffon that this animal and the cougar were not identical. What was Buffon referring to? Jefferson publicly praised the arrogant French scientist as the best informed of any naturalist who has ever written. But privately, Jefferson was outraged by an amazing error he found in Buffon's work. In Buffon's opinion, Jefferson observed, the animals common both to the old and the new world were smaller in the latter. The reasons he thought this were, were one, that the heat in America was less, and two, that water covered more land in North America than in Europe. Deeply offended by the French scientist's slight to his homeland, Jefferson dedicated himself to refuting Buffon's erroneous assertions. While assembling the facts on the matter, it dawned on Jefferson that he should use his work to support his private mission, gifting copies of his critique to selected members of the Marquis de Chastelux's lettered circle might establish him as a peer in their eyes. When the self-described savage from the mountains of America reached Paris, his first call was on his former congressional colleague, Benjamin Franklin, who was then American ambassador to the court of King Louis XVI. Jefferson asked Franklin for the name of his printer. Six months later, after revising and correcting his text, Jefferson had Franklin's printer print 200 copies of his book. He handed out nearly four dozen of these to the cognoscenti of Paris and elsewhere. The rest he sent the chancellor of his alma mater in Williamsburg, Virginia. In this way, Jefferson did attract attention to himself, and he was welcomed into the best circles of Paris. This probably owed as much, however, to his appointment to replace Franklin as the American ambassador, which he did in late June 1785. When you read my book, bear in mind that Jefferson executed his plan and succeeded in his private mission. He wanted to associate with the best and brightest people in France, and he did. This concludes my comment on Thomas Jefferson's French plan. If you have any questions about this or other aspects of Thomas Jefferson's life, you can contact me at jct at commonwealthbooks.org. You can look inside the book and purchase a signed copy of Thomas Jefferson's Enlightenment at www.commonwealthbooks.org. Thank you for joining me. I look forward to speaking with you again soon.